Hey guys, welcome back. This is Bimsy Codes, and this video is going to be part two of our polishing of the game episode. So the first thing we're going to want to do is adjust the values of our progression system, um, the droppable spawner game object. So you'll notice straight away in our game, the uh, progression of the droppables, the spawn rate of them is super unforgiving in that they sort of ramp up really fast until the whole screen is filled with the droppable objects. So we're going to go ahead and fix that and make it feel more natural. So going to our droppable spawner game object in the hierarchy, I'm going to set this target multiplier. Now this is the rate at which we decrease the target time. So I'm going to set that to 0.9. So essentially every time we hit this increment, um, we're going to multiply this target time by the target multiplier. And it was essentially multiplying it by 70% before, which is why it was increasing so fast. So we're going to set our target time to 1.5. So we start at a 1.5 second spawn rate. And then I'm also going to increment the increment from 1.5 to about 5 seconds. So every 5 seconds, we're going to be multiplying this target time by 90% or 0.9. And I feel like that'll look way better straight away. So let's give this one a test. And we'll sort of see the progression in our game. So starting out, it's looking pretty easy. And we'll see it slowly ramp up now till the game becomes harder and harder. I sort of like this. Um, we might actually be able to get away with decreasing the target time to maybe points. 0.8 or something like that because it is a bit too easy starting out in the game um, yeah I might do that so let's actually take a look at our droppable spawner and you'll notice this is at 0.5 so if we start at 0.8 I think it'll be a lot better because it, it'll start less slow but the ramp up speed is still going to be more forgiving than it was before, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, now the next thing we want to do is also fix the target score to win the game, because 200 is now going to be too easy to attain with our new progression system. So I believe the target score was just on our player. And now this, it might be better for us to actually have the target score variable exposed on our droppable spawner, since that's the progression system, but this will have to do for now. So I'm going to make that 500 just to make that win condition a bit harder to get. So I've actually gone ahead and edited all of my droppable prefabs. What I've done is I've gone into each droppable prefab. If you just double click your prefab, it'll take you to the prefab view. Um, now to get out of this prefab view and back to the scene, you can just click scenes in the top left. So again, I'll double click the cheese to go to the cheese prefab. And what I've done is I've set the scale of all of my droppable prefabs. So all the obstacles and the scoring prefabs to 1.5. And I've also re reoriented the child object, which is the model objects that we have for those prefabs, and sort of made it uh, visible and sort of scaled it up within the constraints of the colliders. So I've gone ahead and done that for each of my game objects. And the reason I wanted to do this was just so they're oriented properly when they fall down the screen. So if we go ahead and play our game now, we should be able to see all of those droppable objects slightly bigger and also oriented correctly, so they're sort of visible. So before the cheese didn't really look like cheese, the banana, the banana didn't look like bananas. So now those objects are just dropping from the sky and they look a little bit better. Um, so go ahead and do that in your own projects if you want. So back in the scene, when we play the game, I'm actually noticing that there's a little bit of sh like uh, dark shadows around a lot of our droppable prefabs. So you'll notice they're a bit dark coming in from this angle. So I'm actually going to put another directional light in the scene that doesn't project shadows and I might just reduce the intensity a little bit. So I'm going to copy this one out and I'll move it over here and we'll just orient the direction so it sort of illuminates those droppable objects as they fall into the screen. Um, I'll reduce the intensity of those maybe uh, 0.5 and also we'll take no shadows here. I don't really want to duplicate the shadows that's coming in and we'll just make that white so we don't have any uh, specific colors that's being pulled through from that. Um, and we'll take a look again at our game scene and see if that's illuminating those game objects a bit better. So they seem less dark, but I might just want to set this rotation. So I'm just rotating that game light. And we can sort of look at our player to get a good visualization of how this might look on the droppable objects once they're in the game. Let's go ahead and run that again. 
pretty happy with that now. They sort of look a little bit brighter as they're coming in. Um, and I might just reduce the intensity of this directional light to 0 0.7 or 0 0.65. And that's looking pretty good. So the next thing I'm going to introduce are some boundaries to the screen so our player can't just run straight off of the screen like that. Um, so I'm going to unplay the game and first I'm going to uh, make this directional light a child of the other directional light just so they're sort of categorized together. And next I want to right click in my hierarchy, add 3D object and let's create a cube. Now let's reset the position of this transform. Maybe we'll actually uh, copy this component of the player and we'll paste that in here. So let's uh, paste component values and that'll just mimic those component values of the player to sort of visualize that better in the scene is a good starting point. And I want the boundaries of my scene to be right here. So that is about 20. So we'll just round that off to a flat 20. Um, now I'm gonna press R and scale this one up in the height. So we've got the height of our player being about, I'm just gonna cover the entire screen just uh, like that. Call this one boundaries, or boundary, singular boundary. Like, uh, and we'll just duplicate that one out and make this negative 20. So we see our boundaries on the sides there. And now when we hit play, if we try to run, it'll stop. And because our velocity has actually hit zero, the player will go straight into his idle stance. So that's what we actually want. Um, so the last thing I want to do is just uh, make these boundaries a child of each other. So if we move one, they sort of move together. And then I'm also going to disable those mesh renderers on both of them. So we can't see those, visually see those boundaries. Um, there's actually a bug that exists in our game. So when we play the game and we win or lose, so if we quickly pick up some cheeses or some uh, burgers, so we'll grab this cheese, grab this cheese and grab this burger. Uh, you'll notice that the things are still moving in the background, so we can actually trigger our win condition while we're waiting for the level to reset. So we're going to go ahead and fix this now. So let's jump into our game manager script. So what I want to do in my game manager script is essentially stop the game in its tracks when we hit this reset condition. So I'm going to go ahead and create this stop game method. And then we've got to create it as well. So what we can do here is we can actually hover over this since it's an undefined method. Go to the left-hand side here and we can generate method, stop game, and that'll create this whole method for us. Um, define it with an error log or an error message when we call this method since it hasn't been defined yet. And what we're going to do in this stop game method is we're going to want to find all of our rigid bodies that exist in our game scene and we're going to want to stop them, set them to is kines kinesmatic true and that way they will no longer interact uh, with physics as they normally would. Uh, rigid, so I'm gonna call this rigid bodies equals find objects. So make sure that's plural, objects of type. And this is gonna get all of the objects of a type that we provide in our game scene. So we're gonna wanna pass in rigid of type rigid body. And then we're gonna wanna loop through, so for each. And if we hit enter and then double tap tab, it will fill this out for us. So I'm gonna say for each rigid body, and we'll call it rigid, um, in our rigid bodies array, we're going to do rigid dot is kinesmatic, and we're gonna set that equivalent to true. And we'll see what this does in a second. Um, and then finally, we're also going to want to stop our droppable spawner from spawning new droppable objects. So we want to do game object, uh, and we want to find the game object. So let's uh, find our droppable. Now we have to make sure the spelling of this is correct in terms of the game object's name in the game scene. So I think droppable spawner is correct. Um, just make sure that's correct on your end or else there'll be a bug here. And we want to set that one active to false. So it's no longer active. It can no longer create new droppable game objects for us. Um, and then we also want to get the player and stop the player from being able to move. So to do this, we're going to find player and we're going to get, um, we're going to get component character controller. And we're going to disable the character controller from being used. So let's set the character controller dot enabled is equivalent to false. Now this should work for us in our game, I believe. So let's go ahead and test this out. 
So I've actually introduced a bug here which we want to fix quickly before we go back into our game and test it out. So let's go to our droppable spawner and instead of setting it active to false, we want to grab its component and just stop its component from spawning new objects. Now we want to do this because each of our droppable objects is a child of the spawner. So if we disable it, they'll all disappear, which sort of looks a bit weird. So we'll grab our droppable spawner component and we'll just enable it and set that one to false. So that should do the same thing as our player here where we get the character controller and set it to false. So it'll no longer spawn game objects for us. So jumping back into the game and we'll test it out. So we'll just grab the cheese really quickly. Um, hamburger, cheese. And when we lose, the things don't disappear and the game sort of stops until we reset the game. So that's sort of the intended functionality that we want so the last thing I want to do before we finish our game is go into our RPG pack that we imported and I'm just going to sort of pretty up the game scene. So in this segment I'll just speed up the time so you guys can still see what I'm doing but it'll just go a bit faster. As you can see, we've populated our game scene and we've thrown in all the assets to give our game a better sort of vibe and it's sort of come together really well. Um, I've thrown all of my assets that I'm using that aren't actually part of the game, the sort of environmental assets, and I've thrown them into this uh, scenery folder. So I like to just do that to keep my game scene, my hierarchy neat. Um, when we play our game here, we can actually see the final product. Um, and feel free to get creative with how you sort of design your game. That's the, that's the fun part about the game design. Um, so it's come together quite well actually we've got those shadows projecting on the 3d models as they fall down from the sky um, yeah and i think that sort of wraps up this tutorial uh, this lesson on how to polish the final elements of our game and in the next in the next lesson we'll be going through and building our game and getting an executable file that you'll be able to share with friends or family and you'll be able to play your game on the fly all right, thanks for watching, I'll see you later. Mm -hmm.